Welcome everyone. I'm James Chimiak with Chicago Market, and tonight we are doing a online workshop with uh, Catherine Duncan, who is going to show us how to make some chocolate truffles. So uh, this is our latest in a series of online workshops we've been doing for Chicago Market uh, community. And just a heads up that our next one will be taking place August 11th. We're going to have a kickboxing class Ooh. with Torienti Tolliver. Uh, so tonight, uh, our agenda is uh, Grant Kessler from Chicago Market Board of Directors will give us a uh, quick update and background on Chicago Market, and then we will turn it over to uh, Catherine for uh, the workshop tonight, and she'll tell us um, how it's going to work, and also give us a little background on uh, her business and how she got started. So. Um, let me uh, also mention that if you enjoy these workshops we, and you'd like to support us uh, so we can keep doing them and also continue uh, pursuing the opening of the Chicago Market Grocery Store, uh, we do have a donate feature now on our website. So um, you can go online. Uh, Grant just put the link in the chat for us. Uh, so uh, definitely welcome your support if you'd like to uh, if you'd like to support us in that way. So uh, let me go ahead and turn it over to Grant. Thanks, James. It's so great to see everybody tonight. And thanks, Catherine, for doing this. This is going to be awesome. Um, I'm a uh, board president with Chicago Market. And uh, on the off chance that you don't know what we're about, we wanted to give you just a little quick uh, intro or reintro. Um, we are a co-op grocery store coming to the north side of Chicago, but more importantly, we're a better food community of people who are lo after a local, sustainable, and connected um, food community to be a part of. So no matter where we land, we will be that strong. And we are currently um, 1,862 owners. Co we're cooperatively owned, so people own a share in the business. Um, we have signed a lease for the um, beautiful Gerber building, it's called, the space at the corner of Wilson and Broadway in Uptown. Um, you'll find some notes on our website that we are a little challenged by that location, uh, even though we have signed the lease. And so we're currently in the middle of two levels of final uh, feasibility study. One, looking at the operational side of it. We have some professional consultant experts doing some research uh, to help us prove or disprove whether a store can work in that crazy shape. It's a triangle. Um, and then the second part is to uh, research and prove whether the funding is there for it. Uh, Co-ops start because, in part, the people in the community who own it help fund it. So we need to prove that um, there's enough support to make this happen. So we're working on that right now and hope to have uh, announcements along those lines within a month, month and a half. So things are uh, happening fast for us right now. In any case, um, we uh, are see ourselves once open as an alternative to the broken food system that sort of COVID has shown us right now. So if you want to get better connected to food that comes from shorter distances and shorter touch point, fewer touch points, uh, be part of a co-op that brings great jobs to the community, hires locally, um, cares about sustainability and works to you know reduce packaging and keep things as sustainable as possible in the store. That's what we're all about. It's owned by people in the community like you, but um, open to everybody to shop once once the doors are open. And I will leave it at that and get us to truffle making with uh, James and Catherine. Thank you. Great, thanks Grant. Well, let me go ahead and turn it over to Catherine. All right, I think I'm unmuted. How am I, uh, how am I sounding guys? All right, I'm seeing some, some nods and thumbs up. Um, cool, so my name is Catherine Duncan. My company is Catherine Ann Confections. I've actually been in business for uh, 14 years now, which is kind of nutty to think about. Um, but I've got a very small 940 square foot chocolate shop and production studio in Logan Square. Um, and we make truffles, caramels, marshmallows, drinking chocolates, keep it classic, classy. Um, but our focus is on local, our focus is on organic, um, and really, it's funny because we actually focus on something that's kind of hard to 
narrow down, but like basically what Grant was talking about. So supporting the local economy, supporting the local food system. We will like, for instance, the cream we use is from Kilgus Farmstead. I don't know if any of you have guys have had the pleasure, but you know, they're not certified organic, but the cows graze on organic pasture spring to fall. They do a bunch of sustainable grazing practices. Um, they just are not certified organic. So they have some amazing cream that people are proud to work with. Um, all of our stone fruits and berries come from the Midwest, um, come from farms. We actually have a case of plums ready to be processed in the fridge right now. So that's, that's the sort of stuff that we do. Um, we actually launch a new truffle and caramel every week with um, trying again to focus on those seasonal ingredients. So next week is, oh, August is cheese month. So we're going to be doing a cranberry chev rosemary truffle. Um, and I'm always happy to talk about um, kind of fun truffle variants if we get kind of that chance during the class. If we get a little bit of downtime. Um, I would love to talk more about that. But um, let's talk, let's talk a little bit of chocolate. So I'm kind of wondering too, just for formatting, I know some people have kits. We probably, we have some people that are going kind of solo with your own chocolate, your own cream. A little bit of each probably. So we're going to, we're going to talk a little bit about, about all of those. Um, so truffles are not extremely hard to make. Truffles are one of those things that if you get about two or three things right that are not necessarily very intuitive, you will have absolutely no problem. I was just talking with um, a friend of mine about how we just kind of like when we make truffles, we've made enough truffles now that we just kind of, we don't even measure, we just throw stuff in a bowl like an old Italian grandmother and kind of go, go at it, you know? Um, and, it, and it turns out okay. Um, but, uh, you know, really, I think once you get a few things down, you will, be, you will be shocked at how easy truffles can be to make. So you will probably not be surprised to hear that the quality of your ingredients matters, matters muchly. Um, so use really great chocolate. Um, if you guys need any um, more info on what, what that means, let me know. But basically just, you know, should just have chocolate and sugar, maybe vanilla. Um, soy lecithin or sunflower, some sort of an emulsifier is fine, um, but it shouldn't have anything outside of that. Um, use great cream, as we talked about. Um, salt, a little bit of butter. That's, that's the center of your truffles. Uh, it's the simplest recipe ever, four ingredients, right? Um, so we'll talk a little bit about, Funny, I've done hundreds of these in person. This is my first virtual class. So, so if you guys have any specific questions or anything that I missed, please let me know. Um, normally is when we do the chocolate tasting when we're doing in person. So we can't do that here, but I can tell you that when you're making truffles, really just make it with chocolate that you enjoy. So if you enjoy eating a 72% bar, great. That's perfect for truffles. Milk chocolate's great too, semi-sweet chocolate, kind of anywhere in between. White chocolate is a little bit tougher. Um, but it's really, it's just a little bit more delicate. Um, and so I wanted to give everybody just a kind of a quick recipe that you can write down um, for all basically dark chocolate, which encompasses bittersweet or semi-sweet, milk chocolate and white chocolate. So pens out. Um, so all of our recipes I do via weight. So I do use a scale for all of these. I can assist if you ha are not totally sure what, if you don't have a scale. But I do highly recommend a scale if you have one. So snag one of those. You'll also want to have a microwave safe, um, a microwave safe bowl. I use glass bowls in my home. Um, you know, not, not something super large, but kind of a, you know, a nice big pasta bowl. Um, so those, and then I think that's all you need to have ready this very second. So your recipe, I always start with a pound of chocolate. So whether it's a bittersweet or semi-sweet, which we can refer to as dark chocolate, a milk chocolate or a white chocolate, I always start with a pound. Now the liquid is going to vary depending on what chocolate you are working with. If you are working with a bittersweet or semi-sweet, you're going to want to do eight ounces of cream. And when I say cream, the, there are a bunch of different creams that you can buy in the grocery store. There's cream with stuff added to it. There's cream, there's half and half. There's like light cream. 
the easiest thing to look for is look for the calorie content on the label. You want about 50 calories per serving, which I think is two, a table, tablespoon. So that just means it's, it's mostly cream. There's not a lot of milk in there. Um, most cream in the grocery store, if you get the good stuff, is about 40%. Kilgis cream is about 43% butter fat. So it's, it's extra rich, extra delicious. So um, for a dark chocolate, which again could be either bittersweet or semi-sweet, anything, as long as it doesn't have added milk solids, um, you'd want eight ounces of cream. For a milk chocolate, you'd want four ounces of cream. For white chocolate, you want two ounces of cream. Now, if you have something else you're doing into it, I know some folks are doing the, um, the raspberry truffle making kit. You, you, you basically, would, what I, when I think about a truffle recipe, I think of the cream as, as the liquid. So raspberries actually add a good deal of liquid to a recipe. Um, so for, in the case of the vegan raspberry kit, no cream will be used in this recipe. And we can talk about substitutions later. We can make all sorts of stuff. You can use alcohol, you can use kind of whatever you want. Basically take out some cream, add some other liquid. Hey, Catherine, I'm, gonna, I'm watching the chat. I'm gonna quick throw a question at you. Somebody's asking about the percent for bittersweet versus milk chocolate. So the difference between bittersweet and milk chocolate or semi-sweet milk chocolate is just, is just that milk chocolate has added you know, milk solids to it. It's going to make it a softer chocolate. Milk chocolates can range from 10% cacao solids all the way up to like 50%. Most commonly you're gonna find at 20 to 30 percent um and and i think she's asking then about what milk amount or cream amount for which so if you have a milk chocolate you want to use four ounces and bittersweet chocolate would be eight ounces great i think that was the question and then for a half batch yeah you just um i see melanie you were asking about the bittersweet you'd want to do um four ounces of cream if you're doing eight ounces of chocolate which is kind of a nice ratio right two to one so, um, so again, we can talk about liquid substitutions later, but th that's the most important ratio. If you make truffles just with that, they'll probably pretty, be pretty good. But we're gonna make it even better. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I grew up not putting salt into sweet things, which is kind of crazy. We know that's crazy now. Um, you always wanna put salt into your sweet things. So um, for our recipe, we do um, anywhere from a third to a half of a teaspoon for a full batch. Um, you can absolutely do it to taste if you like. It's, it's best to... Um, it's best to um, just be able to dissolve it right away. So I would say you, you probably know your preference, start with whatever you like the most. Um, and then butter. So I don't add butter typically to my milk or white chocolate recipes because they have all that extra dairy fat in them already. For a bittersweet or semi-sweet, anything that's dark chocolate, you want to add about an ounce of butter. Yes, you go ahead and melt the caramel down. We're gonna be um, going to that step next. Um, is, are, is anybody doing the double boiler method specifically? Are we doing microwave mostly? A little bit of each maybe? We'll talk about both. So a double boiler. Wait, Kathleen, can I ask you something? I'm sorry to inter or Catherine, can I ask you something to, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt. I am doing the double boiler. I got one of your uh, packages and it has all three chocolates. So do I mix them, mix them together? Yep. So how much, how much do I put in, how much uh, cream do I put in then? So the, um, let's see, if it has all three, that, then you probably have the salted caramel, I'm guessing. Yeah. So that has a specific, did you get the recipe, did the recipe, did you get like a recipe card with the kit that kind of looks like this? Oh yeah, I guess that would be smart to look at that. Oh, no, so you no, that's a great question though. So um, and something I should have pointed out. So you can absolutely just follow the recipe, and it actually will call for cream instead of cream um, because the caramel has so much fat in it. You'll actually get a better truffle if you use milk. So yeah, I would say pull out your recipe cards if you're doing a truffle kit. This is a great time pull okay. to get and get ready. Okay, and do I put the caramel in with the the chocolate? What, so you, what you're going to end up doing is to microwave. On the other side of your recipe, it kind of has a, a method. Um, so the step one is to microwave the caramel with the lid off. 
Um, if you want to do a double boiler only, you could definitely, you could honestly even put it in your oven. You just, you need to get the caramel nice and soft and gooey. Um, okay. so you can put it in a, in a, a boiling water bath to cool it, to get it warmed up. But if you're going to do that, I would say definitely get it started now because it's going to take a few minutes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, of course. So basically if you guys are working with a salted caramel kit, this is a great time to kind of soften your caramel. What we're going to try to do is mix the caramel fully with liquid. Um, before we add it to the truffle um, ganache, just to make sure we don't have any big chunks of caramel in there. Unless that's a desired result. That's the great thing about this. There's no wrong answer. So um, chunks of caramel sound good too. Um, basic dark chocolate is one ounce of butter. Oh yeah, makeshift double boiler is great. That's what I do at home all the time. It's wonderful. Just make sure the heat isn't turned up too high. Uh, you can absolutely um, scorch your chocolate. Okay, scorching chocolate. That is actually, uh, folks, the biggest thing. If you can walk away with one thing from this class, if you know how to not scorch your chocolate, that would be the one thing to take away. Um, so really, I, I would say that's where everybody fails when they first start. I absolutely have occasionally scorched chocolate. Um, um, it, it's, it's, it's more rare these days and usually um, involves a screaming child in the background um, as I run away. But, um, but truly, that's, that's the biggest reason I think that people find chocolate so difficult to work with. So chocolate, when it burns, it doesn't, it doesn't boil, it doesn't smoke or sputter. What it does is it actually separates um, the cocoa butter, which is the fat in the chocolate, will separate out from the rest of the chocolate. So you have kind of like this layer of, of oil on the top of your truffle. And so a lot of folks, if they have, you know, experience with, with other baking or cooking, they might think, oh, I need to stir more or I need to reduce the fat in my recipe. But neither of those will help if your chocolate's already burned, um, unfortunately. Stirring, stirring actually can help. And we can talk a little bit later about how to fix a, a slightly broken ganache, a uh, slightly scorched ganache. But uh, yeah, if it smells like unsweetened chocolate, it's probably gone past the point of repair. So to give you guys an example, we're going to do a one pound chocolate batch. Um, it'll make about 45 truffles, but we will only heat it in the microwave for about a minute um, on a double boiler. It really depends on the heat and the conductivity of the bowl, but it might take three minutes, five minutes. It's gonna be pretty quick, um, which is a lot less than people think. So I always say use the hand test. So our hands are, I mean, everybody's hands are at a little bit of a different temperature. Typically we find right around 90 degrees that's when chocolate starts to melt. And that tends to be the temperature of your palm. So if you feel a bowl of chocolate, if it feels like it has any vestiges of warmth at all, it's probably still melting. Um, so that's when I usually say, hold off, stir, let it sit for 30 seconds, let that heat kind of even out, feel it again. Um, and we'll talk about that um, as we get to melting, which I think, are we, are we, are ingredients collected? Are we feeling like we can start, um, start measuring and talking about melting? Thumbs up. Cool. Um, okay, so I, if you are using chocolate bars, now remember, burning the chocolate is the biggest thing we're going to try not to do. So if you microwave just a whole giant chocolate bar, chances of it burning are very high. So you want to cut it into small pieces. If it's very thin, you could probably break into the small pieces. But the goal is to get it pretty small, even pieces. Um, we use these. Um, they're called calais or pistoles if you wanna be fancy. But they're just tiny little wafers. They're literally 0 0.05 of an ounce. So they're pretty small pieces. They're meant for melting. Um, that's what we use here. If you start ordering your chocolate 500 pounds at a time, you too can get this chocolate. So I'm going to measure a pound of chocolate. I'm just gonna make a basic semi-sweet chocolate ganache with a 58% cacao semi-sweet chocolate. So I'm gonna measure one pound into my container. If you have a little bit under, a little bit over, that's totally fine. All right. We feeling ready for cream? Ready for liquid? Um, okay, if you are doing the salted caramel kit, hopefully your caramel's nice and soft. Um, you'd wanna scrape that into a bowl, mix it with milk. Just with the hot milk. So you basically want to mix the milk in 
So let's say you have all your caramel in a bowl. You want to mix in about a teaspoon of the milk until it's fully emulsified. Another teaspoon fully mixed, that sort of thing. If you put all the milk in at once, it's going to be pretty hard to emulsify the caramel. It'll, it'll just kind of clump up. Um, if you have the raspberry kit, you, I, I've seen some busy mashing going on. That's perfect. So make sure your raspberries are mashed with a fork. And then mix that raspberry powder in there. It looks great. Um, basically, the raspberry powder can kind of clump up. It's just freeze-dried freeze raspberry. Um, yeah, you can buy chocolate from us. We don't officially sell it to you, but we totally can. Um, if you have no kit for the caramel, you want, um, I think, uh, hang on, long sheet. Six ounces of caramel. Um, Brad, I think we were talking earlier, I believe you have a kind of a caramel sauce, if that's correct. Um, if that is the case, I'd probably do eight ounces of that and only one or two ounces of milk. Should get us in the right ballpark. Um, okay, so that's good. And then if you have the hazelnut, that's the hazelnut kit's super easy. You basically just kind of mix it all together. Um, okay, so we've got our chocolate. Let's add our delicious Kilgus cream. So I'm doing eight ounces if it's um, any sort of a dark chocolate. Four ounces for milk. Um, that would be weight. Four ounces of cream for milk chocolate, two ounces of cream for white chocolate. So white chocolate, the reason it scorches so easily is that it has so much more cocoa butter in it. Um, white chocolate doesn't have it. So there are two parts of chocolate, really. There's the cocoa butter and the cocoa powder, essentially. And then you mix them together and that forms a delicious chocolate bar. Now, if you take out the cocoa powder and you just have to use the cocoa butter, that is white chocolate. Good white chocolate, anyway. Um, there's a lot of white chocolate that actually doesn't have any cocoa butter in it at all. Uh, that, uh, Sue, that's correct. You use the milk with the caramel kit. You don't use any, um, no cream, and you mix, have all the chocolates together. Um, Bonnie, the amounts, I'm not sure which one specifically, but the chocolates, you'd want to start with a pound. Cream, if you're doing the caramel, you'd probably want, um, it, well, I'm not sure if you're doing a milk or a bitter, dark chocolate. You mentioned bittersweet, so I'm guessing that's correct. So you probably want, if you're doing the caramel sauce, you'd want eight ounces of that caramel sauce because it's already somewhat of a soft consistency and probably two ounces of milk. Best guess. All right, so I've got my chocolate. Um, so it does, uh, you, you can absolutely leave, if you're doing a double boiler, Hannah, you can absolutely leave the heat on. You know, really, as long as it's gentle, you'll be, you'll be totally fine. All right, I've got chocolate, I've got cream. I'm gonna put in a little tiny bit of salt. Ta-da! And then my one ounce of butter. If your kit doesn't call for butter, that's because you do not need it. I believe um, none of the kits actually call for butter. Maybe the hazelnut does. You think I'd know this? Who designed this anyway? Oh yeah, no butter, look at that. Okay, so I've got everything ready to go. I don't think I can really show you guys, maybe I can. Hi, look at that. So you should be able to, um, you know, it's just chocolate and cream. Um, the cream should be like not quite covering the chocolate. That's just a good kind of sanity check. Make sure that you don't have, if, you, if your chocolate is entirely disappearing into your liquid, something has gone uh, terribly awry. Um, okay, so melting. If you have this on a double boiler, the best thing you could do is turn it on and then as soon as you see, so to make shift a double boiler, um, Melanie, one, one ounce. To make a double boiler, you basically just need a pot with a, a, an inch of water, of simmering water in the bottom, and then you need a bowl that essentially is going to trap that steam in the bottom and melt very gently, melt whatever's in the bowl. So you can use any sort of bowl, you just you kind of want one that will, 
you know, cover the pot entirely and not sink into it. You do not want your water to touch the bowl. Um, so if you're doing a double boiler, basically just watch for the chocolate to start to melt around the edges. And then you want to stir, not quite constantly, um, but you can't go wrong with constantly if you're not sure. Um, so basically you, you want to stir pretty often. If you do it in the microwave, which it's funny, we actually started off the business doing um, totally double boiler. So we'd have these like giant bowls of chocolate and cream on top of a double boiler. And we've moved exclusively to the microwave um, because it is so much more reliable and much, much more hands off. Um, you know, in a kitchen, we can put something in for a couple minutes and walk away and kind of prep your next item, which is great. So for this size of a chocolate for a full batch, I'm going to microwave for one minute. If you're doing a half batch, probably 40 seconds is good. Um, if you have a glass bowl, you might need a little bit more time than this, but this is a great time. Pop it in, do one minute, or uh, kind of, you know, frantically stir your double boiler. So glass bowls take a little bit longer to heat up, but they also insulate pretty well. So. Um, it's something just to keep an eye on that. It's going to cool down more slowly. So here's that chance of burning your chocolate. You just have to just have to be careful and you'll be good. Um, any questions while my chocolate's melting? We're all a bunch of very competent cooks. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Um, where where does the where does the milk go right now? So if you're making the um, with the caramel sauce, you're gonna want to mix the milk in with the caramel. If it's already a sauce, though, you might just be able to put the milk, caramel, chocolate, and salt all together in a bowl, and then just kind of mix it all together and melt away. All right, I'm gonna go see if I can stir this batch. Ta-da, I love these silicone spatulas. They're amazing, they're heat proof. We actually could, we'll put the whole thing in the microwave. I'm not even joking. You know, you stir something a little bit, it needs a little more time. We will absolutely put it, the whole thing in the microwave. It's heat proof. So this is kind of cool. I don't know if you guys remember how the um, ganache looked with kind of the chocolate rising up a little bit out of it. So now it's melted to the point that, I'm turning my screen here and trying to give you guys the glamour shot. Basically you can't see any chocolate in it at all. So that's a great sign. That means the chocolate is starting to melt. Um, one of the reasons I really like melting the chocolate in the liquid is the chocolate doesn't really lose its shape when it melts if it's just by itself um, until it's really melted. Um, so frequently people will think their chocolate isn't melted at all. They go give it a little stir and it just flattens right out. So this is another good sign. Let's see if I can show you guys my, my bowl as I stir. We're seeing lots of melted chocolate. I'm seeing a couple of tiny little pieces there, but I'm seeing lots of melted chocolate. Another way, um, that I like to tell people that they can tell if the chocolate's really in a good spot is if it, if it kind of feels like cake batter. When you do, you know, do that figure eight pattern through the bowl, if it feels like cake batter versus melted chocolate or um, unmelted chocolate, you know you're in a good place. Um, I'm also feeling the edges of the bowl. You know, it feels, it feels warm to me. So that means even though I can see a couple of small chunks, I know that it's continuing to melt. Stephanie, do you think you could hold the computer so that I can stir this ganache while... Thank you. It's just like holding it over. Yeah, everything mixed together, Bonnie. Okay. So what we've got now is all the chocolate's melted. I'm not seeing any big chunks, so I'm gonna go ahead and fully stir it in. The best way to stir ganache, if you can, is to just stir from the center. You'll see it kind of turn glossy and smooth and beautiful. And then you'll start to incorporate the, uh, the cream from the outside, scraping the edges of the bowl, making sure that you get everything.
This is looking perfecto after one minute. And this is kind of what we're looking for. We uh, we always refer to this as having having good good body, good viscosity. So it's making these beautiful swirls. We're not seeing any chunks of chocolate, no streaks of buttercream. So there's a tiny chunk of chocolate. I wonder if that is visible. Ah, can you guys see that? Now the cool thing is, you see that kind of light colored streak right next to the to the dark ganache, like through the dark ganache? That means that that chocolate is still melting. And again, it still feels warm to my hand. So even though there's that one little chunk, I'm not gonna worry about it at all. I think it's gonna totally melt in there. All right, that was the glamour shot. How's everybody's ganache coming along so far? Um, Sue, how long did you eat it for? So it should seem thick, um, as long as it seems homogenous, like if it's smooth all the way. Um, Sue, I would doubt that you've ruined it at that amount of time. Um, for now, I would say keep stirring. You could also involve a whisk. And then maybe let me see it. It could, it could be um, that the caramel was not fully melted or mixed in with the milk. So you could have little chunks of caramel in there. Because grainy would make me think like a minute and a half, two minutes of microwaving. That's, that's usually like super, super scorched. And that is 40 seconds and 10 is absolutely not going to scorch it. Um, Lisa and Andrew, I would say if it seems thick, that's, that's fine as long as it's homogenous. We can also do a quick ingredient recap and make sure that you had the right quantities. It might need a little bit more liquid if, if everything's fully melted. Because this actually, I mean, I mean, this is, you know, decently thick, you know, I'm getting a good deal on the spatula until I tilt it. So maybe you just did a perfect job. All right, teams, how are we feeling? Can you pop this in the freezer for me, please? Thank you. Great, Susan, I like to hear that. So a whisk is something that we don't use in the, in the commercial kitchen because it incorporates air, which lessens our shelf life but I 100% use it at home. Um, it's a great way if you have a, just like a few couple stubborn clumps, or if your ganache is very slightly broken, it can bring it back together. Okay, broken ganache, that's a great um, topic. Ooh, there we go. Okay, so a broken ganache is when it's very slightly overheated. Um, so chocolate can burn, I mean, we've talked about chocolate starts to melt around 90 degrees. Chocolate can burn as low as 110 degrees. Now it depends on the, the brand and it depends on, you know, milk and white chocolate burn more easily. Bittersweets, uh, you know, dark and semi-sweet chocolate, they're not gonna burn until about 130 degrees. Still, both of these are well below what most people think of as burning, um, which is why it's so hard, so easy to, to overheat your chocolate. Now, if you overheat your chocolate and you have, you know, if it looks kind of very slightly separated, if you see like tiny little trails of fat running through it, that is totally fixable. Um, what you'd want to do is add probably half an ounce of cold liquid. I usually do milk. You can do water. Uh, right in the center of the ganache. And then you want to whisk that or, or mix it with your spatula really vigorously. Really just in the center to start, kind of how that technique I was using with the ganache. That will bring that tiny little bit back into to, to, um, emulsion. And then you can kind of, you know, widen that circle, gradually incorporate more and more chocolate. So that's how you fix a mildly broken ganache. Not that I've ever had to use that technique. Should we take it off if it looks like it's done? 100% off the heat? Okay. Yeah, pull it off. Can we see yours again? Yeah. 
So if your ganache is totally done, um, I didn't I didn't tell you to prepare a spot in the freezer, but prepare a spot in the freezer. Basically, it'll take about 20 minutes to fully chill down. Um, and then I can show everybody how to roll the truffles as well. I could also do just a quick demo um, once we get there for, um, you know, even if you don't have a, have your uh, ganache ready. Okay, so here is the one we have. I don't know if you can see it. I'm kind of blocking the light when I turn the, the, the computer. Is that a little better? I mean, if all the chocolate's melted, you're, you're, that's when you really know you're done. Ideally, you have a, a shiny, kind of glossy ganache. But that also, um, my first few ganaches were not shiny and glossy, they were just melted. Um, also, the vegan ganaches are much harder to get that viscosity. Um, here you go, please. It's much easier, with, uh, much easier with cream, but they will set up very nicely. Um, that's another kind of interesting thing to mention is the vegan ganaches. So the way that we've done it is we've wrote, you have to not only replace the liquid from the cream, you have to replace the butter fat from the cream. So we actually use this um, really great sunflower oil. It's from a farm called Century Sun Farms up in Wisconsin. They make an organic sunflower oil that's just, just delightful. Um, it also has the most neutral flavor of most of the oils that's very slightly nutty. Um, so versus like an olive oil, which olive oil makes a great ganache, which, you know, it tastes like olive oil. Um, or coconut oil also makes an awesome, awesome ganache. So those oils are great. We typically, if we were to replace the liquid from the cream, we'd want to do three ounces of, you know, some sort of liquid, um, a fruit puree, a um, mango, um, Literally, I have done water-based ganaches, which are great. And then you want to do five ounces of sunflower oil. So that is a good, good vegan ganache. So if you guys have your ganache in the freezer, basically set a timer for 10 minutes. And then what you're going to want to do is stir right around the edge. Um, specifically, that's what's going to be the coldest. So after that 10 minutes, it'll be, it, it will look exactly the same, but it actually will have lost a lot of its heat. Um, and then after a second 10 minute period, it will be, it depends on the freezer, it depends on what sort of airflow you have. But after that second 10 minutes, um, it should actually be pretty close to ready to scoop. Then the other thing you're gonna need, you can absolutely use a spoon um, or two spoons, but I love if you have like a little cookie scoop, I'll, sh I'll show you guys what I use. I think they're actually called dishers in restaurant parlance. Um, once, at one point, this said how large it was, but it gets about half an ounce, so it might be half an ounce. Um, Madeline, if you want to add alcohol, I think that's a great idea. So I would always recommend reducing your liquid. So if you want, so I do the base amount of alcohol I usually add to a one pound ganache recipe like this is two ounces. Um, if I want a very strong flavor, you can have three or four ounces, but I would say go down to six ounces of cream and then two ounces of whiskey. Now you can absolutely just kind of add it and have slightly gooey or truffles. That's not the worst thing that's ever happened. It'd be a great ice cream topping. This is the same ganache, by the way, everybody, that you put on top of those um, beautiful glazed ganache cakes. Um, you would just want to add probably 50% more liquid. So, you know, 12 ounces of cream instead of eight. And then, yeah, just pour it right away. You could, you could if it looks too thin, you can um, refrigerate it for a little bit or freeze it for a little bit. But I use this for um, frosting cakes regularly. We'll also make a great frosting. You can just beat it in the stand mixer until it's. Oh yeah, you can freeze truffles. Truffles freeze beautifully, actually. They uh, once we scoop them, 
we're going to roll them in something to kind of make so they don't stick to each other. So uh, cocoa powder is the most traditional if you want to be very French. Um, cocoa powder is a good place to go. You can do um, granulated sugar, powdered sugar. You can do granulated sugar with a little sea salt, extra fancy. Um, and then you just want to um, put them in an airtight container and freeze. If you freeze them on a, on a sheet tray, you can then put them like into a bag if you want. Otherwise, you could just use any sort of Tupperware or whatever. Any other questions so far? Have people tasted their truffles to make sure they're delicious? I'm seeing some nods. Great. That is a very important part. Honey, you absolutely can. So if they're freeze dried berries, you can probably just crush them with your hands. If they're like um, sun dried, you know, kind of chewy, you can do that. What does that measure across the top? Let me grab a ruler and I'll let you know. Okay, my scoop, I would guess it is exactly a, could be a one and a half, it might be one and five eighths inch. I'm not sure how deep it is, but it's round, so. Hey, Catherine, a lot of times the scoops go by numbers. Does yours have a number on it, like a number 23 or a number 25? I couldn't find one. So it's either, it, it may have, and it just, oh, you know what? It's a number 70. It's looking on the oh, wall. That's, that's typically how you'll find them in restaurant supply places, yeah. is by that number. I'm used to looking on the inside of the handle. So yeah, no, it's on the back. It's a number yeah. 70. And I have a question. We um, we decided to make half of our ganache earlier today and put it in the fridge so they would be cool, so it would be ready tonight. But with, then we made the other half just now. Um, how long should we set out the one that was in the fridge to bring it to room temperature, or whatever temperature you need it at to roll? Before rolling. Sure. Um, honestly, you can definitely skip it right from the refrigerator. Just be careful not to break your scoop. You know, what I always say is kind of keep it gently off the top. So instead of getting one giant hard lump of chocolate, you, you kind of, you know, work it a little bit. Um, so if you have it out now, by the time we're um, scooping with everybody in 15 or 20 minutes, you should be totally fine. Um, Bonnie, if you just put the chocolate in the freezer, you're good to go. I think we'll be fine. Um, Nancy, I think that sounds like you're going to make a delicious almond um, truffle. I would say just chop it up um, maybe a little bit more finely and then you get small pieces of almond or an ice cream topping also sounds very good. Madeline, you are asking if you want to cover your chocolate truffles with a chocolate shell, would you just melt regular chocolate chips and roll them in it? So you can't quite do that you need to do what's called tempering your chocolate which basically when chocolate melts the cocoa butter doesn't set up properly unless you do unless you temper it and I'll, it sounds fancy but tempering just means that you're aligning the, the fat molecules in a certain way much like tempering steel or tempering glass it's just taking a product and, and treating it a certain way um physically treating it um so you can temper chocolate um does anybody want to know how to temper chocolate because i could totally tell you so um so the easiest way to do it at home is the seeding method. There's also the lab method, which you probably have seen in those old school fudge shops where they're like working it back and forth on a marble board. That's a little bit tougher, um, even though it's, it's quite a bit quicker. The seeding method, what you would do is let's, let's say you wanted to, to temper a pound of chocolate. You would melt said pound of chocolate. You know how to safely melt chocolate now. Um, you want to melt it to at least 105 degrees, but no more than like 115 degrees probably. Then you would add 30% more chocolate. So about five ounces, 
and you would stir that fairly often until it reached 90 degrees. And then you'd want to pull out any remaining chocolate, any remaining seed chocolate that had not melted. You'd want to pull that up. I want to cool it down from there to anywhere from, I say this like it's a big temperature range, but anywhere from like 86 to 87 degrees. And then you want to heat it up to 88 and a half degrees. You need to hold it between 88 and a half and 92 degrees for it to be, to set up properly. So I actually will hand temper tiny batches, like if I have to dip 30 truffles for a special project, typically we dip 1,000 truffles a day. But if I'm dipping just a few, I will absolutely hand temper in the microwave. You know? And then you, I can dip, you know, a few truffles, microwave it for eight seconds to kind of just flash it back in. Uh, you can do it on a double boiler, absolutely. That's tempering trap, it sounds so easy. Um, and yeah, if you get a little bit out of temper, um, you'll, you'll know, you'll get like little streaks through your chocolate. Maybe it'll be a little thin or a little thick. Um, that's that's the, the fun of chocolate, keeps us guessing. Any other questions? We can talk about recipe modifications. If anybody has a truffle they want to create, we can come up with a recipe right now. I've got some dried bananas. Any suggestions to go with it? Ooh. Um, I admit, I do not love dried bananas just because banana flavor is so great and it's so easy to put into a truffle. But what you could do for the dried bananas, if you made a banana truffle, it would make an awesome, right. if you, yeah, if you uh, chop it up or um, puree it, kind of turn it to, into super tiny bits in a food processor, oh, I bet yeah. it's awesome to roll a truffle in. So a banana truffle, we typically, bananas are not quite a one-to-one -one replacement for liquid. So I probably do six ounces of banana, three or four ounces of cream, depending on how soft and squishy they are. Mm -hmm. And then really just, you need a little bit extra butter because you lost some of that butter fat. Um, but that's, I, I love bananas in truffles. They are so easy, they're so good. Um, if they need to, they just need to be super ripe because you, if it's even a little bit green, you can taste that starch. It's kind of shocking actually. Um, cinnamon cocoa, cinnamon hot cocoa. Um, that would be a great coating. Um, a hot cocoa mix would be great. It's just going to be cocoa powder, maybe sugar, probably sugar, and then probably a dry milk powder of some sort. And, you know, in this case, cinnamon. Um, Susan, did you add, how do you add a nut in the middle? So then you can just take a whole nut and you can just roll your chocolate ganache around it. That's, that's totally straightforward. It'd be kind of cool if you then have chopped nuts and you roll it in chopped nuts, the same nut, that'd be delicious. John, you can absolutely do things with coconut. So you can make a totally vegan ganache using coconut milk, coconut uh, oil, and co coconut cream is the best because it's nice and thick. Um, it's got lots of fat in it. I like, fat is delicious. Um, it makes really good truffles. So coconut cream is awesome for that. If you want to use flaked coconut, that's totally great too. Um, you can roll the truffle in flaked coconut. You can do toasted coconut. Uh, John, at 10 minutes, you want to stir your truffle ganache. Stir it pretty thoroughly and then put it back in the freezer for another 10 minutes. If it doesn't feel chilly at all, make, just make sure you've got a good kind of draft coming to it so that it can cool off in time for me to show you how to roll truffles. Um, I made an Almond Joy truffle once for the you coconut lovers that was really good. We took coconut milk and then actually steeped, we soaked um, shredded coconut in it. So it, it got that like kind of super soft, juicy texture. And then just white chocolate and salt, almond extract, I think. Super good. How's everybody's uh, truffles looking so far? Is the graininess fixed? Okay, 
looking good already. It's looking good already. Ours is starting to stiffen up. We should have a demo in 10 minutes. Maybe a little less. Um, Sophia, the thing that I found with lavender, if you want to use lavender and not make your truffles taste like soap, is, is really just being super judicious and using a tiny amount. Um, lavender is kind of, kind of funny because um, it also loses flavor over time. Um, I talked to a distiller once who actually said that lavender loses its flavor within uh, like two to three weeks. So um, I th the way that we use lavender, we actually now buy lavender essential oil, which is pressed from the lavender petals right after they're harvested. Um, so I think that's, that's what we use just to make sure it's consistent every time. If you're doing it at your house, what I would do is do dried lavender um, into your liquid, so typically cream, heat it up, let it sit for 10 minutes. And honestly, when it smells good, strain out that lavender and use it to make your truffle. Um, Sophia, let me know if you have any follow-up questions. Caleb, how stiff should the ganache get? So when we are having it set up in the freezer, we actually want it to be um, close to the point where you can't stir it anymore because what our next step is actually going to be rolling the ganache in our palms. So if you think about it, you, it really can't be sticky. Like you should be able to press it with your finger and it should come away clean. Um, marzipan and truffles would be a great idea. I've actually not worked with marzipan. I know you could do something with almond paste. That would be delicious. We use almond butter all the time. Um, I, I honestly just wouldn't know exactly what to do. Um, I think it would depend on how firm the marzipan is as far as how to adjust the recipe, that sort of thing. I think marzipan has such a delicate flavor. I typically see it only covered in chocolate. I think it, if you tried to fully, you know, emulsify it into a truffle, I think you might lose kind of some of the awesomeness that makes smart pan so delicious. Um, John, my current favorite flavors. That's a good question. I really do like cheese month. August is a very, very fun month for me. So we just made my, one of my favorite truffles. It's apricot feta and balsamic. Um, so we take apricots and have them and roast them till they kind of turn into preserves. And that's nice because it reduces the moisture so much that we can do a lot of apricot in the recipe. And then it's an 18 year age balsamic and then just like crumbles of that, um, you know, super salty, tangy feta cheese. So I love that truffle. I also am very classic. I have been eating hazelnut truffles pretty much every day this week. It's just been my jam. Um, I also enjoy the citrus truffle. It's lemon, orange, lime, and lemongrass. So it's just very refreshing, very summery. My friend is saying blue cheese and port. That's, that is one of those like very kind of polarizing flavors that if you love it, you love it. If you hate it, you hate it. Basil. Basil with what? Oh, just by itself. We do a basil truffle every, um, I think we do that in May. And it's just so simple. It's just, you know, a whole handful of fresh basil pureed, infused, and then pureed into the cream. Um, some fresh squeezed lemon juice and then semi-sweet chocolate. Very simple, very delicious. Um, Susan, peanut butter is awesome. Peanut butter is also kind of a funny one because it doesn't really behave like like other, it's not really a liquid, it's not really a solid. Um, so I really like the flavor of peanut butter. So when I make a recipe, I use a lot of peanut butter. My current recipe is about, is equal parts peanut butter to white chocolate. And then nutmeg, a little bit of nutmeg, a little bit of salt. So no fat, no cream, no milk. Just like that. It's kind of a, I guess almost Buckeye-ish, I wonder. Um, but we have done it before, kind of like that with, um, with water and milk, you, you really can't add fat in the form of cream because it, it, it just is too much fat for the recipe. It will, it will break, it'll kind of separate out. 
Um, Susan and I always will toast any nut that, or tree nut especially that we work with, um, for sure. Yeah, and I like to toast them until they, they smell fragrant, until they're starting to dark in color a little bit. And then I answered peanut butter. Um, Hannah, lemongrass, what would pair well with lemongrass? So when I think of lemongrass, I think of like kind of Thai cuisine. I think it would be really awesome with, um, with a, you know, a fresh herb, with ginger, something like that, coconut, curry, something spicy. There's a book that I really love called The Flavor Bible that is, it's awesome because it basically has ingredients like this and it, like lemongrass will have a section and then it'll have maybe 10 to 20 flavors of things that go really well with lemongrass. And it has savory, it has sweet, um, like the chicken section is going to be a lot longer than the lemongrass section, but it does have a bunch of different ingredients. Julia, you said you had technical issues, so I'm going to um, message you right now. Yeah, I actually use the flavor a lot when I'm designing truffles. Like even right now, you know, I, um, we've got these plums in the fridge and I really want to do a new seasonal lemonade with them. Um, and so what am I, what am I gonna do with plums? Because they're, they're not super sweet, they're a little bit tart. So do I add another sweet fruit to kind of balance out the lemonade? All right, Julia, I'm messaging you again. I love strawberry basil lemonade. What was that one? I love strawberry basil lemonade. Strawberry basil would be awesome. I just want to do something specifically with plums. Were you thinking plum with the strawberry and basil? I was referring to the lemonade. Oh, okay. Yeah, I want to make a lemonade with plums in it, so I could do that with an herb and another sweet fruit. That might be there. We'll, we'll have to see what the flavor bible suggests. I've done a plum and green pea truffle before that I really like, so I might go that direction. Rosemary might go well with plum. Yeah, I do have rosemary growing out back. That would be good. I also have lavender. Plum and port, now that would be a good lemonade, Susan. I like the way you think. It's my own personal lemonade. <laughs> so I think we briefly talked about putting alcohol in, um, in truffles. I actually really do love port. I love those kind of, those um, liqueurs, port, brandy, um, super good. Um, but really do two ounces less cream and add in two ounces of alcohol. That's a pretty easy substitution. Um, Hannah, I love the banana and lemongrass with curry idea. Lisa and Andrew, lemongrass and malort. I mean, I know this makes me not a true Chicagoan, but I'm just not a malort lover. <laughs> Lisa's declaiming any responsibility. How much longer do you think we have on the um, ganache? Five. Five minutes, okay. Five more minutes, everybody. Then we're gonna scoop. Okay, well, we can get ready to scoop. So um, we've talked a little bit about different things you can roll your truffle in. So again, cocoa powder is the most traditional. We can do um, granulated or sugar or powdered sugar mixed with sea salt is fun for the salted caramel, or if you just want a little something salty. Um, 
dehydrated fruit powders that are crushed up are awesome. They look super pretty too. Um, toasted coconut, fine flakes of toasted coconut, um, chocolate shavings, chocolate on chocolate is never bad. Uh, sprinkles. I'm trying to think of other granular things that we usually do. Yeah, any sort of nut, chopped, toasted, chopped nuts. Make sure they're cool. If you roll the them, the truffle in there while it's warm, that would go that would go poorly. Um, Susan, either Dutch process or regular cocoa. It does not matter. Really, only matters in baking where that can affect the acidity. Um, Sadie, we can absolutely do strawberries and truffles. Um, you'd replace. 100% of your cream with strawberries. It probably, if you do a fresh strawberry puree and you literally mash them up with a fork, you could probably do eight ounces of strawberry. Um, we puree our strawberries up in the blender so they're super smooth. So we can only do about six ounces just because it's so liquidy. But yeah, 100%. I, use, I like to use a pretty mild chocolate because you can overwhelm the strawberry flavor pretty easily. Oh, Susan, yeah, chai to a truffle is awesome. I do a white chocolate chai tea truffle that's really good. I've also done a cranberry chai caramel that's one of my favorites. I found these um, sun-dried, unsweetened, tart cranberries from a, uh, I know they're in Wisconsin, but I can't remember the name of the farm, but they are amazing, or caramel, because caramel is so sweet, so it's super good. Um, second time in the freezer, Hannah. Uh, yeah, so if, you're, if your ganache is still not set up, honestly, just pop it back in the freezer. Sometimes it can take up to 30 minutes. We, I mean, our freezer's at literally minus seven degrees, which is much colder than most uh, home freezers. So yours might take a little bit longer. And then the best thing you could do too, you know, is just make it so somewhere with that air circulation so the air can keep moving. Moving and cooling. Nancy, I have um, never had a sugar-free chocolate that I liked, but I'm always up for experimenting and trying more. Uh, space for rolling and scooping. Um, you need about two cookie sheets worth of space if you want to, but really just a tiny, like a tiny space. You don't, you don't need a ton of room. I was about to say a full sheet pan, but probably most people will use it. And then we're gonna roll on to um, a big old sheet of parchment paper. You can use wax paper. You can even just put them right on a plate. It's very forgiving. Any other truffles that anybody wants me to design? We can come up with some recipes. I know people have mentioned chai, but what about other like tea flavors? Like, are there any specific black teas or herbal teas? Yeah, you 100% can do tea. I love doing tea in the, in the truffles. Um, you basically would want to infuse it. So um, put the tea, loose leaf is gonna be the best, of course. So put tea right in with the, sa the same amount of cream. Uh, heat it up just to boiling. Let it sit for five or 10 minutes, a little bit longer than you'd actually normally steep tea for just to get kind of an intense flavor. If it smells good, it's probably good to go. And then just strain it out. Really make sure you like squeeze the liquid from the tea leaves because that's where a lot of your flavor is going to come from. And, and I will say our tea truffles tend to be more subtle than, than some. I mean, you'll, you'll, you'll get something. Um, if you really want to make it intense, you can either A, leave the tea right in there. B, what we will sometimes do is puree it in a blender and then strain it. So you get like those very tiny microscopic specks of tea in there. But I love tea um, and chocolate together. It's a great, great flavor. The cherry and Earl Grey tea truffle is one of my favorites but I like fruit in my chocolate. Uh, okay, 
know that I mentioned booze, but what's the process for including it? But so booze really, just because you, you take out some cream and you put in some booze, you just kind of put it in with everything else, mix it in at the same time. And then somebody else was talking. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll be here. Um, Hello again. Hey. It's, what should I do? Oh, sorry, what should you do with what? I took the chocolate out of the freezer. It's like frozen. Okay, just let it sit out at room temperature. Um, see if you can scoop, you know, if you can kind of dig a spoon into it, then you're probably good to go. But it should be pretty, pretty firm. Um, Max, age 10, wants to know if you can roll the truffles and peanuts instead of cocoa powder. I think that's a great idea. Just make sure they're pretty, uh, pretty chopped up pretty small. Um, olive oil truffle is great. We actually, for cheese month, we've got an olive oil and Parmesan truffle that's going on the menu. So we do a little bit less cream and then um, probably three, four ounces of olive oil. Get that flavor to come through. Um, elderberry liqueur. I, wow, you made your own elderberry liqueur. That is incredible. We actually have a raspberry elderflower truffle on the menu right now. I think it's amazing. Um, elderflower by itself, I mean, it really depends. We're using, um, I think, the Thatcher's elderflower liqueur. Um, and it's, it is more subtle. So you get kind of a little bit of that floral, a little bit of that fruitiness. Um, but um, I would say it depends on how strong yours is, but two, three, four ounces, something, maybe, maybe a little bit on the, on the higher side. A grapefruit and run truffle, that sounds great. Oh, um, oh yeah, oh, elderberry, not elderflower. I don't know, I've never worked with elderberries. I have tried an elderberry drink one time and I thought it was very delicious. It would probably be great just by itself. It's such a unique flavor. Maple bacon is shockingly hard to do because the flavor of maple it just ends up kind of getting overwhelmed by chocolate. Hilariously, my, so my husband got to join the business about um, five years ago, soon after the birth of our first child. So he, um, stepped into production for quite some time. And, and I remember I was having difficulty with this maple flavor, getting maple to come through. And it's like, well, Aunt Jemima uses molasses. Why don't you try that? And honestly, it, it really makes a huge difference. So we, in anything we do that's maple, we'll use some maple syrup for sure. But truly, I would challenge you guys to taste me, even if you know you've put it in there, you will have such a hard time tasting it, even the nice, like robust flavor. So we'll probably do, you know, We'd reduce the cream to six ounces, add some extra butter, and then probably do two ounces of maple syrup and a whole ounce of molasses. And then roll it in maple sugar. Although if you want bacon. So bacon is pretty, is pretty easy. You can use bacon fat instead of the butter. And then just make sure to fully cook your bacon. You know, you should render all of the fat um, or else that you get chewy bacon instead of crispy bacon and then chop it pretty finely and just mix it right in. It's a dry ingredient. You can throw dry ingredients in all day. You can put in nuts, it will not change, you know, it will not make your truffle too soft or too hard. I think we're actually getting pretty close to a truffle demo. How are we looking? It might be a little bit soft. Another minute or two. Although you guys can watch me fail at rolling truffles and then um, feel, <laughs> feel really good about um, how messy I get. Yeah, we can, yeah, we just leave it on. Yeah, let's go. 
Uh, Susan, I'm not sure. Oh, use tomatoes. Have you ever used tomatoes in the truffle? So um, we have uh, one time because I thought sun gold tomatoes are super sweet. They're delicious. Maybe they would be good in a truffle. And this was back when we used to hold tasting parties at the shop, basically before I had kids. Um, and so we, during the tasting party, one of our regular customers asked me, she said, so who lost the bet? And I said, what do you mean? She's like, who had to put tomato in a truffle? And I was like, oh, I, I'm guessing that means you don't like it. Um, so I got, you know, I only did it once. Uh, I got varying responses from, uh, it's interesting, which is not my favorite response to, um, again, the, the bet, um, to, um, to, I mean, some, some folks legitimately like, and I think some folks really just want kind of a cool experience. They want maybe something they haven't tried before, but I honestly didn't dig it. You know, I, I, uh, I didn't dig it. Maybe like a slow roasted tomato, you could get some of that sweetness, but then I think you might have some texture issues. I don't know. It'd be fun. Um, I do do truffles with goat cheese. Actually, we have a goat cheese walnut truffle that's been on our menu for 10 years and we actually have a trophy sitting in our shop because we won um, a Sophie food award for it, um, which specifically in the chocolate and confection category is really hard. I think they had like 80 entries and we got the bronze, which I was very, very excited about that. So um, a truffle with goat cheese is um, slightly more difficult. Um, I like using the fresh chev. Um, something that's a little bit tangy is nice. Um, and then I'll just, you can even just make like kind of a classic semi sweet ganache, follow all the same um, steps and then let it sit out to set up at room temperature. Right before it kind of turns peanut butter consistency, you wanna crumble in that goat cheese and mix it just a little bit. Um, the reason that I do that is I find if I fully emulsify the goat cheese into the ganache, I don't really taste it anymore. I want those like chunks of fresh shove all the way through it. Now you could totally be as kind of detail oriented with this if you want. If you wanted to make truffles and then pipe goat cheese into the center of each one, that would be awesome. Um, that would be very delicious. So yeah, you, I love goat cheese and truffles. You could also do a more aged goat cheese and just kind of melt it right into the, into the ganache. That would totally work. So how do you pipe something into the truffle? So you'd literally, I mean, it needs to be pretty soft, but you know, you take a round truffle and you just stick your piping bag right in there. Imagine like piping into a cupcake. It's a little harder because, you know, cupcakes kind of have a little more, a uh, little more give to them. I've only done it a few times and it, you know, for us, it, it doesn't make sense, but I imagine if you're doing it at home, it, maybe you could have a little more, a little more success with those very, the stuff that labor, labor wise doesn't make sense for us to do. I've also seen a lot of layered ganaches, a few, um, you know, for folks that really take their chocolate making seriously, um, where it's like, you know, it'll be a ganache on the bottom and then like just white chocolate and goat cheese on the top. So you can do some, we've, we've done some like that. Um, and basically you, you kind of make the same truffle recipe and then you do what's called slabbing it. So you just pour it onto a sheet of parchment paper with a frame around the edge and you let it set up and then you cut it. So because they can be a little bit softer set, so that style, that method um, does allow for a lot of, a lot of fun possibilities. Should you let the ganache sit when it comes out or stir it? Um, give it a stir for sure. If you can stir it, it's probably not ready to roll yet because it's probably a little bit too gooey or sticky. If you can't stir it, that's that's good. Leave it out, and then we will uh, we'll get to scooping very soon. Anybody else have any questions, comments? Uh, Melanie, if the exterior is hard and the inside is squishy, then what you want to do is you want to kind of stir as much of the exterior as you can into the interior, just to make it kind of more even. Honestly, if you just want to scoop a few truffles from that hard exterior, that's fine too. It's, it's going to be the same product long term. It'll just um, set up a little more evenly if you can mix it all together. Go ahead.
Not good. Try the coffee talkie. Though. We've got a bin of um, chocolate snacks because we all, anytime anybody goes anywhere, it's we always bring back some chocolate bars or some bonbons or fun things to eat. So it's it's a, a very high demand, um, you know, snack in the shop. You'd think we would need to eat more chocolate, but we do. Uh, Susan, if yours is frozen, leave it sit on the counter and we'll uh, give it a scoop soon. That looks great. All right, so I'm going to show you. This doesn't look pretty, but it'll look pretty soon. This is the ganache that we've been stirring. You can see how, you know, when I touch it, it really doesn't, you know, maybe a little chocolate comes off on my finger, but for the most part, it doesn't. That's when you know you're, you're pretty good to go. Um, are most folks ready for me to do a little scooping demo, scooping and rolling demo? And then we can make all sorts of puns, like that's the way we roll. Okay. My kids don't think I'm funny either. That's okay. My daughter's actually, uh, she's five and a half and she's very into knock knock jokes, but she makes them up entirely. So it would be something like knock knock, who's there? Chocolate, chocolate who? Chocolate spoon. You know, so, um, so I started saying, well, I'll tell you a joke. And so I started, you know, the orange, you glad I didn't say banana. You know, I think that's just, that's the knock knock joke I learned how to tell knock knock jokes on. And so she listened to a couple of my jokes and after I explained to her why they were funny. And then she said, mom, can we go back to telling real jokes, please? <laughs> Ouch. Um, all right, so uh, Stephanie, would you please grab me a thing of cocoa powder just to roll these into? Um, so what I do when I'm rolling truffles, I actually have a damp towel next to me and I'll use it just to wipe off my palms because your palms are sure to get dirty. Um, we wear, um, it's actually a little bit easier to roll truffles when you have uh, gloves on. So that's typically what we do. Gloves are in slightly high demand right now. So no need to do that, but um, you can also just let your ganache set up a little bit more if it's sticky. That's the biggest thing. If it's still not set up, you know, if you're letting it set up at room temperature, let me back up a second. If you don't want to freeze the truffles, if you're making ganache and you want to roll your truffles tomorrow, that's great. Just let it set up at room temperature um, just on your kitchen counter. That's actually what we do at the shop. Um, the, you, the freezing is a great kind of hack to just move, move things along. Um, you can, if, if your, your ganache has not set up after being overnight or being in the freezer for 30 minutes, you know, being stirred a couple of times, um, it could be a recipe malfunction. It could be that there's just, there's too much liquid, not enough chocolate, the chocolate didn't all melt, um, something like that. That's, that's typically your most, three common most, um, um, yeah, three common most uh, problems. So, um, we're gonna give this a try. I just have my little scoop here. I've absolutely done this with two spoons. Scoop a spoon in, use another spoon to scrape it off, kind of like making cookies or something. But I'll just fill the scoop like that. And then pull shit out onto your palms. And then here's the tricky part, everybody. You want to roll this truffle and get it out of your palms in about two seconds. So one 1,000, two 1,000. Ta -da. Um, the, I, that really is a fairly arbitrary number, but really it just helps the chocolate from melting. That's all. Um, typically when people make truffles for the first time, they spend about eight or 10 seconds trying to roll that perfect truffle and you do it just so much of it melts onto your palms. And after that, I just have this little dish of cocoa powder and I rolled the truffle around in that. Now, if you have kind of a, a granular ingredient, uh, chopped nuts are an example, anything that's kind of chunky, you can actually roll it a second time to really make sure the nuts or, or similar adhere. So I'm gonna scoop it out. So a little trick, if you have one of these scoopers like I do, after you squeeze the handle, a little bit will pop out. I'll actually hold the part that popped out, release the lever, and it'll just come right out onto my hand. 
So you won't be doing that whole like scooping, squeezing over and over again, trying to get it to come out. How's everything rolling? I see some, some chocolatey hands up there. I know, right? Take this from Jordan. Now what am I gonna do with all these truffles? I guess I'll give them to my children. All right, anybody, uh, how's it going, everybody? Do we have any questions, concerns? I'm seeing some, some nice rows of truffles appearing. Back in the freezer. Sounds good. Always fine to take a little break. Wash your hands. Run some cool water over your hands if you need to. Cool off your palms just a little bit. Never a bad plan. Uh, Susan, if it seems very frozen, but it's still really sticky, that's, that's kind of hard to say. If it's firm, you know, if, like when you squeeze it, it doesn't really give up its shape very easily, then it might just be that um, you need to roll quickly, you need to make sure your palms are clean when you start. Um, if it is still kind of gooey, then it absolutely needs to go back in the freezer for a few more minutes. So what is everybody rolling their truffles in tonight? Anybody want to share? Deliciousness. <laughs> so we've gone all kind of crazy with our toppings. We've got the cocoa powder. We had the uh, salted caramel kit. So we've got the cocoa powder and the cocoa nibs, but we mixed some like spiced sugar with some cardamom and cinnamon into one of the powder bowls. Um, we also did uh, some cashews that we kind of ground up with some curry powder Ooh. and then we have what did you he did like a coffee, coffee bean cardamom, and a little cardamom and nutmeg. some nutmeg that sounds delicious crushed pretzels sea salt and espresso powder pretzels. awesome i love i want to do a pretzel truffle i just i can't get the uh, pretzel, the pretzels basically absorb the moisture from the ganache so quickly, they kind of turn turn soggy. But man, a, a pr nice pretzel dipped into ganache, like freshly made ganache, absolutely awesome. Such a fan. Looking great, Stephanie, looking great. <laughs> like I haven't done away. What's that? Like I haven't done away for yeah. six months. Everybody has. <laughs> I 
Hannah, yeah, if it's hot in your kitchen and starts melting, um, stand in front of the air conditioner. <laughs> the you know, it's one, one good thing about having a chocolate shop is we have to keep it 72 or less in here. So I am, I am never hot, but, uh, but yeah, honestly, just chill them down a little bit more. Um, Caleb says, my wife, Cassandra, wanted me to say hi. Hi, Cassandra. <laughs> Susan, roasted hazelnuts and pecans sound great. So store in your truffles, they will keep for, if you don't eat them all tonight, they will keep for, I would say 24, 48 hours just on your, on your counter. Just do, you know, do cover them. Um, ideally an airtight container of some sort, because they'll, they'll start to lose their moisture. They'll start to dry out a little bit. Um, if you want to keep them for longer than that, you can refrigerate them for several weeks, again, in an airtight container. And they do freeze just extremely well. Um, so three months in the freezer. Um, do try to bring them to room temperature before you eat them. And you'll have the best kind of silky texture and the best flavor if you can bring them to room temperature. So has anybody ever made truffles before? Is this everybody's first time or are we all, uh, are we got some pros here? Has anyone had Catherine Ann's? Good question. First time. First time. Awesome. Virgins, nice. So who is planning on making truffles again another time? Yes, awesome. I always try to demystify making truffles when we do when I do classes. And one of my most proud moments was when a woman made truffles for her own wedding after taking one of the classes, which I think is the ultimate compliment. <laughs> Yes, when you have friends over again, that's a great time to make truffles. But you can do little care packages with truffles and drop them off when it's less hot outside. We have a lot of old chocolate. So you can probably use that old chocolate if it still tastes good. Um, it's just, uh, it kind of looks a little melty. I can't really tell. But um, it, I've noticed that even if chocolate tastes good, it sometimes just takes a little bit longer to melt. So you really kind of have to, to work it with a whisk. Um, we, so the other truffle, I, I, let's see, Kate, I think you're asking if we have other kits available. For sale. So we only have truffle making kits and that was a new thing basically when COVID happened. Um, we had always thought about making a truffle kit and very few people do. Um, make truffle kits and i've always thought it's because it's i think it's really hard to to do without well it's not really that hard to do again but it's knowing these tips knowing this like how to not burn your chocolate that sort of stuff is kind of tough so i think that's why most people didn't do it so we actually did design these for covid for the kind of the idea that you, people we wanted to give people that stay at home experience so we have three truffle making kits um salted caramel hazelnut and raspberry raspberry vegan 
do not have any other kits right now. Hey, can I jump in? James, can you uh, unmute yourself and have your uh, friend there ham it up for the camera again so I can get a screen grab of her? <laughs> we all want to hear her. Well, yeah, if she unmute, if he unmutes, then she'll be the large view on my screen. <laughs> tell him, tell him what you think about the truffles. They're really good. Can you hold one up for me? Show me your work. Um, sure. Let's see. You see it? <laughs> I do. Well, Eleanor, how'd you like the truffles? They're yummy. <laughs> Thank you. Back to back to you, Catherine. Well, you know, once you guys, once you guys need, uh, need summer jobs, you know where to go. <laughs> Uncle James is the greatest, isn't he, for bringing you over for truffle making? <laughs> yeah. Now, now I got them hyped up on sugar and take them home to their parents. <laughs> That's the job of uncles and aunts. <laughs> Spoken as an aunt myself. So Catherine, we actually have like, let's see, two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, we have like twenty truffles. And we only did a half batch. That's, a, that's awesome. I, I say they usually make 40 to 45. So you guys were scooping them about how I scoop them. Awesome. Yeah. So that should get you through the night at least, right? I'm surprised I didn't eat the chocolate before even having the class with the box sitting on our kitchen table the past two days. <laughs> I always have to taste the chocolate before I get started just to make sure it's still good. I'm just saying. I, I did have one of the little chips. I did have to try one of the dark chocolate ones before we mix them all together. Caleb, thank you for coming and thanks for joining us. Thanks to you too, Susan. Uh, lemongrass paste that sounds uh, I have actually never used that before so I do not know what it would um, taste like is it um, uh, imagine it would be kind of the texture of like a pureed ginger but Hannah what what kind of texture is it is it like thick it's like a pureed yeah it's like a pureed ginger it's in a tube I squeeze it out oh um it's probably pretty intense right yeah you strong yeah Honestly, if it's the texture of ginger, you could probably even try just, I mean, what I do when I'm testing out new, new things is I'll take like a quarter of my ganache batch and I'll just put in like a teaspoon and kind okay. of- Okay, mix it in. Yeah. Yeah, I really think you, you don't need to change the recipe too much. You could probably just add a little bit of it. If it turns okay. out those things where you want an ounce or two ounces, then you might want to reduce your liquid a little bit. Okay, it's kind of oily. It's a little bit liquidy. Oh, okay. Yeah, maybe even, you know, seven ounces of cream, seven and a half ounces of cream, half an ounce of the, half an ounce of, about, which is about a tablespoon. You know, some of the oil is in my hand and it just smells really good. It smells really nice on my hands. <laughs> that wow. totally makes sense. <laughs> I wonder if I could put it in my hand and just roll it right into the. Oh, that's yeah. a good idea. Yeah. It wouldn't be bad. Let's see if I can get this going here. Grant and James, I love that you guys schedule kickboxing after truffle making. So we, we make and eat the truffles and then we work it all off. There you go. 1,000 to 1, So if you're rolling in multiple things, is there an order for certain things? Um, if you're trying to roll one truffle in, in numerous 
things. Um, yeah, because it, like if you want to roll, like if you're using cocoa powder, for instance, nothing's going to stick to it after you dust it in cocoa powder. So you kind of okay. want the largest ingredient first. You know, like if you're doing hazelnuts or like a chopped nut and, and something with a smaller particle size like cocoa powder or granulated sugar, you want to roll it in hazelnuts first and then cocoa powder. Okay. Usually I, I mix, um, I would mix the ingredients together. Um, oh, I see. Okay. Well, so for instance, if you wanted to add, to make a spicy truffle, mix some cayenne and habanero into your cocoa powder, powdered sugar or something like that, and then go for it. We did have one truffle making class where some, I forget, somebody really loved spicy food and they just rolled it straight up in cayenne. Wow. Really that. I, I would not even try it. That's so way too spicy for me. See, the younger crew is cleaning up properly. You've got to lick the, lick the fingers, lick the spatula, lick the bowl. It's coming off on my palms, but I'm, it's rolling, so. The, the lemongrass oil or the truffles? The chocolate, the ganache. Um, they could be getting a little warm, or your palms could be getting a little warm, or it could be that they're a little sticky from the oil. Yeah. Um, Susan is asking if I've put the ganache to cover the marshmallows. So not really. Um, we do a layered s'more in the shop where it's a graham cracker, salted caramel ganache, and then marshmallow on the top. And then we dip that whole thing in chocolate. So it, we have done that. Um, but yeah, to, to cover each marshmallow in ganache would just be a, a labor of love. Um, for Easter this year, we did some lemon meringue bunnies where we did like a filled, a chocolate shell, a dark chocolate shell, and then I piped in a lemon ganache and then piped some marshmallow on top. That was pretty tasty. We, Lisa and Andrew are asking about the vegan marshmallow. So we did many cool things in February and early March this year, and then we stopped doing all of those cool things um, when the pandemic hit. So, um, we're actually anticipating to have a fairly decent holiday season, even though we don't have most of our wholesale business, just because of, of actually folks like you, our online sales are, are way up. So I'm planning to overhire. Um, and if we end up being a little slower, I've got that list of like, we've got all the kind of wild ingredients to make a vegan marshmallow. We just need to take that, that week and, and knock it out of the park. So I've got a lot of projects on the back burner that if we, if we get the time, we'll work on it. Sue, I like that you're prioritizing dessert before dinner. Very wise thinking. What if some drastic accident were to happen between, you know, dinner and dessert? That would just, gotta have dessert first. <laughs> Dana said she thought this was dinner. It's my kind of dinner. Get a peanut butter truffle with some protein. This is what I tell myself. <laughs> What's that? I had a lot of chocolate today. <laughs> okay, I'll take this one home and take all those. Does anybody have any more questions or comments? Melanie, hilariously terrible is a great way to start. <laughs> Catherine, you were talking about cheeses and I remember you saying, um, Feta cheese and Parmesan, were there other cheeses that you've used? So I would say goat cheese is the, the most common one that I use, um, mo mostly because it is more universally accepted than the kind of adventurous feta and Parmesan. Um, 
Uh, blue cheese, I would say, is the next one that I've used. It just, it, it is a little bit more polarizing. Um, but I think it's awesome. A little bit of blue cheese would go a long way. You could totally do, um, you know, you can either melt it in there or do crumbles. Um, I would always get a wedge that you can crumble yourself, not buy the, the crumbles. You're going to get a better flavor that way. But um, I've done brie before. I, just, I can't get the flavor that I want. You know, I'll, I'll melt it in there. And you can get some of that kind of, that kind of cool flavor. But I, maybe I might just need to use like a more aged brie. But yeah, that's what I do with brie. I just, um, I'll melt it in there. And then I'll actually chop up the rind and, and put that in there too. I think it's kind of a fun, um, fun flavor. So that's. It's actually on the docket to be one of our weekly truffles this uh, in August is a, I think it's like a raspberry brie time or something like that. I, oh, wow. That oh, sounds really good. good. Yeah, super good. We have uh, one of the monthly specials is a cherry ricotta caraway truffle. Wow. Ooh, ricotta. Yeah, and I got <laughs> kind of, it's not like a super liquidy ricotta. It's actually a little drier. So mm -hmm. if you get a super liquidy one, it'll, it'll melt right in there and it'll actually make kind of a, a lighter texture, which is really good. But I, I think the dry one is kind of fun because you get some kind of disparate chunks in there that you can you can really see and, and taste. And caraway is another flavor that I absolutely love with chocolate. I think it's super good. Oh, yeah. I was also thinking, um, I don't know if you've heard of it, but there's that kind of strange cheese from Scandinavia called Yatos. It's oh, like yeah. a, almost like a caramely kind of cheese. Really? And they, they call it um, ski cheese because yeah, it has the skiers always have it as like a pre-ski, you know, in their uh, you know with their cocoa and stuff for a pre-ski, and a lot of people will shred that yay toast. It's spelled like J O T E S, something like that. Okay. Um, and they'll shred it and put it in their apple pie. So I was also oh. just wondering if like cheese and apple in a truffle would work we, we one of the weekly specials will be cheddar apple and i think i think it's very good it's just one of those things that even though i like it we tend to not eat any of them but i think it's great um i've done we did a great cheese pairing last year with goose island where we actually um paired you know, cheese and chocolate and beer together and you know you get a lot of kudos that have that caramelly taste to them too and yeah. we did a little s'more with a Gouda, an aged Gouda on it. It was awesome. Mm. I would totally do that again. Um, real quick, Caleb, if your ganache hasn't set, um, I would honestly say freeze it again. We could also go over the recipe real quick. Make sure you feel like you're good on that because you can melt more chocolate down um, and add it to there. But I, I tend to lean towards just freezing longer, especially if you got some anything outside on the um, on the edge of the bowl or the container that did set up really nicely, that would indicate it just needs more time. Um, the other thing that could happen is if your cream wasn't, if it was more of a 36% butterfat cream instead of 40, or if it was, heaven forbid, half and half, those, those could be um, factors that would contribute to a liquidy ganache. Yeah, if it's still, if it's pretty firm, then you, uh, yeah, just a little more time. James, I'm wondering if the girls have actually eaten all of the truffles. No. They, yeah. There's evidence. They did some damage. I see. But we got some to take home too. Okay, good. I'm sure your mom and dad would appreciate being able to try what you've made. All right, so John asked, what is different about the hot chocolate mix and the truffle recipe? It's actually, um, I mean, the hot chocolate mix, the, the one we make is just ground chocolate and salt. So there's no, there's no cream in there. You could absolutely use that to make a truffle if you just treat that like chocolate and melt it down. Um, the salted caramel mix does have toffee in there, so it's going to change the consistency a little bit. Melanie, I do think the two spoon method is a tough one. The scoop is, is definitely awesome. But the other thing to keep in mind, you know, we kind of did the freezer just to, to make this move along because I didn't think you guys wanted to spend four hours waiting for your ganache to set up. So it'll be so much easier when you could just let them set up at room temperature or in your fridge, you know, then you won't have the kind of gooey, lumpy, melty challenge that we have when you freeze them. 
One of our team is back from the farmer's market and it was raining outside, holy smokes. Any other questions, storage, flavor design? How many can you eat in one day? I don't, I don't know the answer to that last one. Probably too many. <laughs> yeah, right? How long do they last in the freezer? I usually say three months is a safe estimate. You basically want to avoid freezer burn. So if they're wrapped really well, they might be able to last longer. We've frozen truffles save solidly for a year. Melanie said that Dana and Dana and she have the same kitchen. It's awesome. Yeah, I was thinking about that. I was like, oh my goodness. It's like we have the same microwave and the same cabinets. <laughs> We're in Albany Park. I don't know if we have the same developer or something. But... I'm in Bloomington, Illinois, so I don't think so. It's just a fluke. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, the house is probably was built about 10 years ago. So this was the style of 10 years ago. <laughs> uh, ours was what, 20? 20? 25? 25. Mm, yeah. <laughs> Sue, thank you for joining us. Guys, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blow your minds. Look at the two microwave setup of our shop. What? Well, I've, I've, we've got our little tray here of our variety of truffles that we've done. I think I'm aiming the camera at it. So we have all kinds of different flavors there that we've made it towards, so. That looks awesome. I really like your guys' use of cardamom too, because cardamom and chocolate is just wonderful together. Well, the husband has been grinding cardamom into our cold brew. Cold brew. Oh, wow for our cold brew lately. So we are kind of on a cardamom kick at the McKinney household right now. Uh, Susan, you asked if uh, you want to add citrus, would I suggest juice or zest? So it depends on what you want. If you want the tartness of the citrus, you want the juice. If you want the flavor of the citrus, you want the zest. So when we are designing something, we typically will use both. Um, but it also can be a, a convenience factor of you don't want to stop and juice a lemon or whatever you just can zest them in there so you can either zest it into your cream and heat it up let it sit for five or ten minutes strain it out or you could just zest it right into your truffle you know madeline says she made 35 truffles with a full batch with small sizes which makes her think she may have consumed 10 truffles. So now we know that somebody can consume at least 10 truffles in a day. <laughs> nice job, Madeline. Kudos. All right, Catherine. So um, thank you so much for uh, take, taking us through your truffle workshop. And um, just wanted to see if you have any closing thoughts or anything you want to leave folks with um man many many closing thoughts but uh well thank you guys so much for joining me this is awesome i i love um teaching people to make chocolate so i appreciate you guys being part of the inaugural virtual truffle class this is my 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 first one so it's very cool um i also wanted to say too that you know I know everybody's taking it at very taking uh, supporting small businesses very seriously right now and i also want to mention that it's making a huge difference for us. Like we will, we would absolutely not be here without all of the people ordering truffle kits and sending gifts and that sort of thing. That's what's keeping the doors open and the lights on. I've seen so many great businesses go out of business already and it is just absolutely so disheartening um, because you know the large chains are the ones that have the financial resources to last through this and the small businesses don't have that. So. We, uh, you know, every business owner that I know is just so very grateful to folks like you keeping us in business and letting us do what we love. 
So thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much, Catherine, for sharing your time and expertise. And you said the class would be about two hours and we're just about there. So perfect. Um, thank you so much. And uh, we will send around a follow-up email with a video link um, shortly so folks can, um, we'll have that. And um, as we mentioned, we've got one more, at least one more workshop coming up. Uh, on August 11th, we're going to do kickboxing, and then uh, we also have our annual meeting coming up later in the month. So I uh, hope to see many of you again at those events. So uh, with that, I'll go ahead and stop our recording, and thanks everyone for joining. Thanks, thanks for, for having us.